Clinico Radiological Conference is joint venture between Hand to Shoulder Surgery Unit and Department of Radiology at Max Hospital, Saket, New Delhi. This video is only for educational purposes. Hello, welcome all of you. Uh, there's another edition for Orthoradi Conference in Upper Extremity Surgery. Today with us we have Dr. Ankit. He's a fellow in Upper Extremity Surgery. We have musculoskeletal radiologist, Dr. Amit Sahu, who's a senior consultant at Max Saket. So we'll have today we'll be talking more about uh, shoulder instabilities, different cases, different spectrum. We'll have some idea from the radiological point of view. We'll have some uh, clinical point of view. So we'll start with the first case. Dr. Ankit, you can present your case. So the first case which we'll be discussing is a 25-year-old male who presented to the emergency department with the complaints of pain and deformity and inability to lift the left shoulder while wearing his t-shirt after a trivial fall at home. He had a similar episode one year back following which uh, he had visited a private practitioner and then there have been two separate similar instances in the past and this time around he has come for the third time in the year. Close reduction was done in the year and was followed up in the OPD for further review. On examination the apprehension was positive, the job relocation test also known as the Fraulers sign was positive and he was investigated further with MRI. So uh, Amit can you uh, just uh, uh... Summarize the radiological finding and I'll request you just give us some more relevant. Uh... So are you able to see the screen? Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is actually the MRI was done not in our hospital outside and the patient didn't carry a CD. So we have took relevant images from the uh, film. So the quality of the image is not very good. As you can see, but it is quite diagnostically uh, very uh, specifically seen the findings. So, the sequential axial images of the shoulder uh, where subcutaneous fat is dark. So, this is a fat suppressor. So, this is the glenohumeral joint. We are moving from above and then we are going down. So, this is the superior part of the humeral head and this is the inferior part of the humeral head. If we concentrate on the humeral head, you can see that the posterior part of the humeral head has edema also surrounding it. So this is a classical location of a hill sac lesion. Now, if we go to the labrum, so this is the dark line which you are seeing is the labrum. It should be a triangular anteriorly also, which if you see from here and as we move more down, there is totally deficit of this triangular dark thing. So that is total deficiency of the labrum antero inferiorly, which is because of that bank card lesion. But if you see the underlying bone here, so the, it looks like the cortex is quite preserved. Right? So there is no significant bone loss. Definitely we need to see the uh, sagittal images uh, for this. But yes, quite confidently we can say that there is no significant bone loss. So this is a hill sax uh, along with the bone, uh, bank cards without any bony defect or glenoid bone loss. So this was the uh, findings so of MRI. You mean to say this is a classical recurrent dislocation shoulder with a hill sac lesion without significant right. bone loss. If I summarize right. it. Okay. Sure. So you want to add anything? Just can you just enlighten uh, yeah, so us more about I how to I, cal calculate yeah, so I and how to Correct. So this is a very good example. I've taken a case which was done in our hospital itself. You can see the images are so nicely seen here. So this is what the T1 uh, sagittal image is there. This is the axial image, what we call that as gradient so that we can see the bone cortex very nicely. If we compare this and this image, you can see the bone is much better seen here. This is a, as a previously film showed, this is a fat suppressed proton density image. And this is again a sagittal T2 vertebrae images. So when we see this, so this is the glenoid. It should have been like a smooth, mm -hmm. marginated uh, bone. Here we can see there is an irregularity. There is a crack in between. So there is definitely a inferior aspect. 
now if we go to the humeral head this is the superior most just above the coracoid process this is the coracoid process there you can see it again dip in the posterior aspect of the humeral head so this was a hill sac lesion and this is a bony bank art now we have to see what is happening to the labrum now coming to the proton density fat suppress image if we see the anterior inferior labrum you can see now if you compare the normal posterior labrum here you can see there is a fissure and there is a irregularity some projection here so there is a tear of this anterior inferior labrum now this is a very good image the sagittal uh, either it is a whether you take it a t1 or a t2 so this is the anterior aspect of the uh, humeral head and this is the posterior aspect you can see again the dent here which was seen here in the sagittal uh, axial image so this really round configuration of the humeral head but there it is not seen so this is also an image where we can talk of the hill sacs lesion now just talking of the hill sacs and bankard's presence is not sufficient for the uh, for you to treat the patient now we have to tell the hill sacs lesion what is the size of the bankard lesion whether it is a engaging or a non engaging lesion right so for that i'll show you some demonstrations so this is the glenoid and this is the humeral head like this is the glenoid bone defect and this is the hill sacs humeral head defect and if we compare of the uh, other example or other demonstration so here the glenoid bone defect is smaller than the hill sacs now if the hill sacs is smaller than the glenoid defect what will happen so there won't be an engagement like this will be a smaller defect than the glenoid defect but if the hill sacs defect is larger which we call as the hill sacs index that if it is larger than the glenoid then it the, there will be a dislocation of the humeral head and it goes back and gets engaged so this is an example of engaging lesion and this is an example of a non engaging lesion now in the same concept when we are talking of the uh, calculation of the glenoid bone loss so the most like uh, acceptable method is the best fit circle method what we do we assume that the lower one third of the glenoid is a circle we put a circle here if we can uh, observe that the, the normal bone is not seen till the arc of the circle it is ending here so this part is the bone loss now when we calculate the percentage bone loss we'll see that this is the uh, anteroposterior diameter of the bone loss and this is the complete diameter expected normal diameter of the glenoid so by the percentage normal method we can say that what percentage method uh, what percentage of the bone loss is there when we talk of the hill sacs index in we should always take that index in the axial image where we have to see the complete length of the uh, bone defect the hill sacs defect so this comes becomes the hill sacs index and this come becomes the uh, actual percentage of bone loss now when uh, we talk of we are talking of the engaging non engaging so this length it should be Sm uh, smaller than the length of the bone loss that superior inferior so if this length is smaller that is a non engaging larger it is an engaging now the same if we talk of the uh, n phase this is the 3d images ct images so this is the n phase again best fit circle method of the glenoid which is a normal one and this is the bone loss the red area is the bone loss now there is something called as the glenoid tract so it is considered that the 84 percentage of the diameter of the glenoid tracts with the uh, sorry here uh, glenoid tracts with the humeral head so this 84 percent of the diameter of the glenoid is called as the glenoid tract when there is a bone loss like in the glenoid so what happens the glenoid tract becomes smaller so in order to have a engaging lesion the glenoid tract should be smaller in in order to have a non engaging lesion the glenoid tract need to be larger so here what happens this is the demonstration where we show that there is a hill sac lesion whether it will engage or not now if there is a large bone defect of the glenoid what happens this area is smaller it would go and engage if the glenoid bone loss is larger now this second dotted line that medial dotted line the, from here till here becomes the hill sac lesion now it goes and it will engage so in this is the case where it is a 
more compound, we will have a recurrent shoulder dislocation and the uh, hill sax gets engaged into the bank guard. So this is the concept of the hill sax and bank guards. But just not saying that there is a hill sax lesion, there is a bank guard lesion. You have to talk of whether it will be engaging, non-engaging, on track or off track lesion. So we'll, we'll just talk about the same case as we were discussing. Let me share my screen. Okay, so the can you see my screen? Yes. Sir. Can you see my screen? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, can you see the video? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can. Okay. Right. So I'll I'll just mute the video so that to, to bring the same thing. See, when uh, hill sack is on the track, then it is engaging. When it is off the track, it is non-engaging. Am I right? Yeah, correct, correct. So we are yes, on the sir. same page. So this is what we were seeing in a uh, defect in the head, uh, posterior defect. This is hill sack lesion. You can see this is a cartilage. And this is a bare bone. This is a defect on the posterior spec. This is the same case what Ankit was uh, saying. So what we do when scope is inside, uh, then we just do abduction and external rotation. When you do abduction and external rotation, I'm not. We are not taking it further, but this is like engaging one. You can see it is going up to the anterior edge, and if we go a little bit further, it will just dislocate. Can you appreciate this, Ankit? Yes, sir. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. So definitely. When it goes and touches the anterior cortex of the glenoid, it will just dislocate. It will hinge and against it and dislocate. So this is an engaging kind of a hill sack. And it, just imagine if you have more bone loss, it will engage faster. It will engage early. If a uh, same hill sack, but if there's a bone loss in the glenoid, it will engage early. So this is how it is. Uh, it should be measured. And how does it clinically impact us? It impacts us clinically because what we do, because uh, we don't want to allow uh, hill sack to engage with the glenoid. So we do a, what we call remplissage procedure. In remplissage procedure, sorry, in remplissage, you can see we have pressure in the margin. This is the same patient, same patient after we have washed out the uh, cyanide fluid. So this is your hill stack. And we are going from posterior. We put in an anchor. And once you have raw, made the surface raw, we put in an uh, anchor. with the, It's a double loaded anchor. You can see two types of threads. So we take bites through the posterior capsule and the infraspinatus. So what it does, it will fill this cavity with the tissue so that it stops engaging. So this is how you take bites and at the end of the surgery, you uh, just suture these threads. So we are taking the threads through the capsule and at the infraspinatus. We are not going through the same portal. The, uh, it is out. Cannula is out. So once you I your knots, this all this tissue will um, stick to the raw bone, so it will not allow it to engage. So I'll go further. So you take bites, and this is how you check. You pull the threads. You see, you we are pulling the threads, so then the uh, capsule will stick to the raw bone. The other thing we do, defect. Uh, we fill the defect. 
So other thing we have to do is take care of the bank card. So bank card is this is how we do it. We just put in an anchor in the glenoid. Uh, yeah, this is the glenoid, and we have taken tissue capsule or liberal tissue. We take a huge bites because we have to shift the tissue. Loose tissues we have to shift towards the. So we have to capsule or liberal tissue. We have to shift to. So it's. I don't know why it's always all the time showing. So this is all when you tie a knot, the capsule is shifted from inferior a little bit superior and from the anterior towards the glenoid. So there's a volume of the capsule is reduced, which gives stability anteriorly. And once we have done this, Once you have uh, posteriorly you have stabilized with the uh, reemplissage anteriorly with the uh, bank card. So this is how bank card would look like. So this is how it looks like. I'll just pause it. So this is your glenoid. Here is a bank card. And this side, now you cannot see the defect. See, see, now defect has gone posteriorly and it will not engage now. So head is centralized on the glenoid. You can see very well that head is centralized on the glenoid. So it is well uh, stabilized. And this is how, uh, this is how we uh, stabilize the uh, recurrent dislocation shoulder and this is what we call bipolar fixation or posterior and anterior stabilization. Any questions on it? So Akram is... So asking, would... Sorry? So one thing which I would uh, like to ask is more often than not can we say as a statement that usually all the Bone, uh, the bigger hill sack lesions are engaging lesions as compared no, to non engaging no, ones. Bigger, I don't see well, okay, all the bigger lesions can be engaging, but smaller ones can also be engaging if there is a glenoid loss, also. So it is a combination of both. If hill sack is bigger or if hill sack is smaller, but uh, there is a good amount of bone loss, that is why we have to calculate both things. Then only you'll find whether it is engaging or non-engaging. So is it like whenever it is? Any... I think Akram is joined. So one... Yeah. So uh, one question, Doctor Victor, is it? Sorry, Amit, we can't hear. Surgery. Sorry, uh, you were uh, your voice was cracking. Can you repeat the question? The question is like when the indication for surgery? The indication for surgery is okay, recurrent dislocation or instability is indication for surgery. But we have to decide whether we have to do remplissage or not, depending on um, what is the size of hill sack or whether it's engaging or not. If it is an engaging hill sack, it is always better that we should uh, reinforce it posteriorly also, otherwise, failure rates are high. Especially in athletes. So that is why and, uh, it is important for problems. us to uh, know about engaging and non engaging hill side. One more thing, sir. So there are literature. Cut off. Says that certain certain of the cut off for surgery. Some says it is 25 percent. So okay, like it is, uh, it's, it it's is just very uh, arbitrary. It all depends on what is the profession or what how is the patient. Athletic patient, the chances are see more the bone loss, then you have to add bone to it. If you're doing only bank card uh, soft tissue procedure in a bone loss, they're likely to fail, especially in athletes, especially in uh, wrestlers and weightlifters, because uh, eventually soft tissue will stretch out. 
if there is a very high amount of bone loss then it should be replaced by bone by uh, many procedures you should either you do the bone grafting or take a coracoid or but you have to you have to uh, replace bone with the bone soft tissues procedures in especially in athletes high demand athletes they'll stretch out got it am i think there is a poor connection ankit any questions yes. only this much sir can we uh, one more thing yeah again sir on the simple lines as to what dr amit uh, sau sir mentioned that the choice of surgery if there is a small less than 10% of the glenoid bony defect along with an on track lesion or what we say an uh, the engaging ones are only soft engaging tissue repair track, oh, sorry engaging ones are off track off track yeah uh, the non engaging lesions along with the less than 25% for say for that matter uh, 10% of a glenoid bone loss defect will the choice of surgery depend on the profession and the need of the patient alone or there can be an algorithm which can be uh, formed so as to where there is a very shallow glenoid bone loss defect with a um, on track lesion where only a capsulo ligamentous complex repair will uh, do the job see theoretically okay theoretically you can have a uh, uh, algorithm but see profession profession makes it a uh, makes it important because more stresses chances of uh, uh, chances of you going um, stretching out the lesion are higher but bone loss is not significant then those chances are less so i'll say it should be customized rather than following the numbers like if it is a 19% bone loss i'll go for a soft tissue procedure if it is a 21% bone loss i'll go for the bony procedure rather than you should be talking more about looking at the patient looking at the what is the soft Mind tissue about. see there how, how how much soft tissue uh, is there like many times what happens there is not much of bone loss but you have a, you don't have a much of soft tissue also to suture so there is no labrum it has already labrum is uh, you don't find anything you just have some amount of capsule then we do procedures like rotator interval closure and other things but we uh, today we are not discussing those maybe some other day we'll be discussing those i think we can uh, go for the uh, next uh, ankit now i request you to uh, present the second case some clinical findings and uh, examination okay uh, so sir the second case is about a 42 year old female medical professional by occupation and she complained of on and off pain over the left shoulder and painfully restricted movements over the left shoulder on trying to lift shoulder while wearing aprons and the garments there has been no episode of a dislocation in the past of any significant uh, history of significant trauma in the past but she did complain of a trauma 20 years back of a trivial trauma and there has been a restricted movements thereafter with symptoms which accentuated in the last 3 months on examination she completed tenderness over the anterior joint line where apprehension was positive the x ray which was done subsequently revealed no bony abnormality and hence the patient was subjected to mri thereafter to ascertain the diagnosis any other clinical signs you could elicit regarding instability there was apart from apprehension of course the jobs relocation test was positive there was no sulcus sign which was seen suggestive of there was no inferior instability which could be ascertained on the clinical uh, findings also uh, the patient also uh, the patient uh, did complain of a single incidence in the past so apart from the apprehension and the on and off tenderness Uh, over the anterior joint line only after doing strenuous activities there was no significant findings so it is a single dislocation so single yes. dislocation will we, we i think we should 
single single dislocation acutely we uh, we avoid so the, though some many many schools of thoughts are there that we should operate on single uh, uh, dislocation fresh ones but usually we give it a try for conservative management for healing to happen but in this case the single dislocation after which she was severely like symptomatic in, uh, for the instability that is why she is a medical profession and uh, uh, she was not able to do a lot of activities for which uh, for which she seeked her opinion so uh, amit can we see her mri yeah just, uh, one, more, one more thing sir i would like to uh, add in the uh, clinical history of the patient the patient being a medical professional and it prohibited her from doing her basic uh, checkups i would like to um, give a detail that she was a radiologist and it prohibited her to do routine usg of the patients also so it impacted her not only personally but also professionally so as to which she reported to the opd with the similar complaints okay uh, okay amit we can uh, so amit what okay, are the uh, what are the mean? investigations mm -hmm. of choice for these cases like instability cases this i am just wanted so to that, yeah. yeah so definitely we uh, the first line investigation is a radiograph that is that cannot be missed okay and you can stop sharing your screen yeah and then uh, when uh, there is this suspicion of recurrent dislocation we definitely are thinking of bipolar abnormality so uh, we should do uh, mr according to me is one of this is the best method inside if you want to do a single stop investigation then mr is there because there was a thought that uh, ct scan says better about the bones bone loss but there are sequences and if we do like thin section and the one which i was talking of gradient imaging there you can uh, very accurately get the bone loss both in the hill sacs as well as the bank cards so if we are asking for a single stop uh, investigation that mr is the choice mr so uh, earlier this was we used to get a ct and mri is there any particular protocol we should ask for it or it's like so uh, like many places they say it is a dislocation protocol uh, where like the four images which i am saying we do those sequences along with that we do a thin section of the sagittal t1 or t2 in that case we have also 3d imaging uh, in mri where uh, uh, that is also done but uh, when i personally compared with the 3d image with the uh, routine sequence thin sections i saw that uh, we can uh, talk all of those things which we can say in 3d uh, in the routine sequences in also if we do a routine protocol means properly so you mean to say there is a different protocol for the instability see uh, one of the purpose for this conference that the, there shouldn't be any communication gap so we should not write only mri shoulder we should write mri shoulder uh, with a instability protocol instability protocol correct so th this is uh, yeah this is better thing so we can uh, okay if we can stop sharing your screen we can still see your screen Just go on a stop sure, sharing or okay. I'll try to do it from my end. No. Yes, I have stopped sharing. Yeah, but we can still see your screen. so uh, amit yeah, i think now it's clear so so amit can you uh, show us the imaging yeah yeah so this is that axial images of the glenohumeral joint mri 
of the same patient where this is the topmost image and this is the inferiormost image of the glenohumeral joint. Now, if we see the above images, like the antero inferior uh, labrum is torn as I was showing the previous case. So there is a large Bankart lesion. And if we see uh, the underlying bone, there is some flattening, which was not seen in the previous case. Like, so there is some bony uh, glenoid bone loss as well. Now, when we have seen this, we should also try to search for any Hillsax lesion. Now, if there would have not have been any bank card or any history of instability, if you see this images, it is very difficult to say if there is a Hillsax. Now, but if you go a little more deeper and or you can concentrate more on the posterior aspect of the humeral head, there is a small dip which is seen, also seen in this image. So, there was a very small Hillsax. Along with that, there is a bank card bony. So the bony bank card was larger uh, than the hill sac. So it was a non-engaging type of lesion. I would show one similar case uh, where if you see this is the sagittal image and uh, uh, sagittally uh, the, there is no glenoid bone loss which is seen and the anticortex is very smooth and fine. If we see the uh, sagittal image, the humeral head uh, shape is quite preserved. There is no bone loss which is seen. But when we go to the axial image, you can see there is a dip in the posterior cortex, right? So this there was a hill sac which was not seen on the sagittal image because there's a smaller lesion. In the axial image, we can see there is a anterior inferior labral tear. So there was a bank card which was not bony with a small hill sac lesion, right? So this is a good learning case where uh, if there is a small hill sac that can be missed. But when we are getting the history of instability and there is a bank card, we, could, we should always search for a hill sax. Okay. So regarding the case, um, let me share my screen. So we have seen that engaging hill sac in the previous case. Now I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes sir. Okay, this is non-engaging. See, you can see that as you can see, it is a very small defect uh, as you were appreciating in the MRI also. And whatever we are trying to do, it is not engaging with the uh, anterior cortex. So it is non-engaging or it is on the on track. And so, if we go further, so we're not able to see the uh, video. You're not able to see the video. No, no. Okay, sorry. No, sir. We can only see the screen. I think the screen is more zoom. That is why the. Okay, I'll just take my. Can you see the video now? So yeah, now it's this, is, this is non engaging. Yes. Non engaging. You can see that hill sac is very small and it is not touching the yes. anterior part of the glenoid. So, uh, there you can see cannula coming from posterior. So, hill sac is non engaging. So, how do we do it? We just first we just take the. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yes, yes, sir. Video? Yes, sir. So what yeah, we yeah, do, yeah. we are able to see the video. So what we do, we take a bite from the inferior, anterior, inferior uh, labrum with the capsule. And when we tighten it, you can see that when you tighten it uh, on the anchor, the whole tissue will bunch up and come near the glenoid. So this is a six o'clock position. Our anchor is there. So you can view from the top. And once you tie your knots, the whole capsule would shift. So there will be sh capsular shift from the inferior and as well as volume reduction of the joint. So which helps in giving us the stability. So in this case, we did only uh, uh, cut repair. So now you can very well see that all that tissue which was away, it, it has come very near. And in the end, we usually, uh, last thing we do is, 
we take care of the MGHL also. So you can see last bytes are from the MGHL. So this was a medial glenohumeral ligament, which is tied to the glenoid. And sometimes we take a small part of, we take a small part of, uh, you can say sheath of the inferior uh, supra, uh, uh, sorry, subscapularis. We take a sheath subscapularis so that we can give anterior more stability if our tissue is less. So this is how this I'll pause it. So this is how you can see the anterior gap. There's nothing now. This is what uh, old capsular liver tissue which has come very near the lizard to give the stability. Any questions? Uh, so in this case, case, yeah, we didn't do. So in, uh, this, in this case, we yeah. did do remplissage. Okay, and uh, the bone defect was also not very uh, significant. The so bone defect was not significant, and she is a medical profession, so yeah. um, soft tissue we, uh, we got away with the soft tissue reconstruction. Soft tissue okay. Questions, Ankit? Uh, okay. Uh, one thing, sir, I would like to ask about the uh, clinical examination in this particular case where the patient complains of a very old trauma and had a single episode then with no significant or a, a relevant investigation done then or findings which can be seen apart from the tenderness and only on uh, single dislocation history we could go for an apprehension test uh, which came back positive. Is there sir, any other clinical finding or something which we should look for uh, more um, aggressively so as to know that the patient is to be subsequently uh, investigated further so that we could there is an uh, underlying condition which needed to be treated see but i'd say apprehension is most significant and most important there are a lot of uh, other things are uh, there restriction of like uh, you can say uh, uh, pain on stretching taking abduction external rotation but apprehension tells us that it is unstable because then there's a certain patient will resist a complete external rotation on abduction. So that is one of the most significant tests, I'll say. Sure. You can go for the uh, sure. third case. Sure, sir. We can. Can you see my screen, sir? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, the third case is about a 20 year, 29 year old male. He is a weightlifter by hobby, but he presented uh, to us with pain over the posterior aspect of left shoulder following a history of fall two years back. The pain then was transiently subsided with gentle manipulation by, of shoulder by himself, but it aggravated during his push-ups and other weightlifting exercises. The apprehension was negative, but the jerk and the Kim test was positive. There was no general hyperlaxity was seen in this patient and the patient was subsequently investigated with X-ray and MRI. So can you elaborate on jerk and Kim test? Okay, so the jerk test and the Kim test, in if added together, they have a specificity of around 91%, where the jerk test, we ask the patient to get the shoulder into 90 degree uh, abduction and forward flexion and elbow flexed in a 90 degree angle and as we move the shoulder horizontally as we move the shoulder horizontally we try to give a posterior force over the uh, shoulder and that reproduces the pain and uh, suddenly the patient uh, uh, reproduces the pain which had occurred earlier so that it is positive as to about the Kim test it uh, refers to the uh, reverse um, Bankert uh, lesion, which is also known as the Kim's lesion. So the Kim's test says that whenever the shoulder is abducted it at around 90 degree in the scapular plane, then the subsequent 45 degree elevation and the posterior inferior force given to the shoulder, it uh, causes the instability and the pain is reproduced. So along with the jerk test, the Kim test addition, the accumulation, the specificity is more than 90%. So that is okay, important so. Right? because apprehension is negative most of the time we take out. So this is signifying that it is a posterior instability rather than an anterior instability, which we see most commonly. Uh, okay. Amit, so if there is a Kim test positive, uh, 
so there is like uh, very likelihood that it is a posterior uh, instability right posterior impingement or posterior instability yeah posterior instability okay okay so i'll show you the mr images which is done in our hospital itself okay so uh, these are again the uh, axial and the sagittal image uh, so this this is the proton density fat suppress image where i was talking of we see the labrum here and this is the gradient image where the bone is seen better this is the uh, sagittal t2 and uh, again sagittal t2 in different sequences here we are able to see the glenoid nicely and here you are able to see the humeral head now when you come to the first image uh, this is the in the previous two cases also now you will be must be familiar with antero inferior labrum so here uh, there is a defect which is seen in the antero inferior labrum which is also seen here like there was a bank card but it was also extending superiorly when we Uh, sorry there was a uh, this is the labrum uh, which is normally seen but if you see the uh, posterior yeah. aspect of the labrum i got really so confused is, yeah sorry so uh, when you see the posterior aspect we are not able to see the triangle here which which is nicely seen over the anterior aspect so there is definitely the uh, posterior superior labrum defect is there now if you yeah, see, sorry okay, continue continue yeah. so and when we see the uh, humeral head as i was talking previously we used to see the posterior aspect of the humeral head to see a this bony defect this is the normal contour right and it is below the coracoid so it is not a hill sac now when we see the anterior aspect now the same type the defect which was seen in the hill sac like classical hill sac posteriorly here you are able to see that defect anteriorly now what happens the below the coracoid in the anterior aspect of the humeral head there is a normal anatomical configuration of this dip so many a times this get missed now in order to uh, look at carefully we should see at the level of the subscapular tendon right so the normal contour which is seen in uh, other the normal anatomy there the uh, it is generally seen above the or like the superior fibers of the subscapularis this is exactly at the mid level so this is definitely a abnormal depression of the anterior aspect of the humeral head now and this is again yeah yes sir some and in uh, the right side also you can see this defect right side image yeah. so under the subscap same. same same yeah in the below the subscap and if you see the sagittal image there is flattening of the anterior aspect of the humeral head right and we are not seeing any uh, antero inferior glenoid bone loss what about posteriorly like, so posteriorly there is a little dip but this there was actually not much of bone loss uh, which was seen on the posterior superior aspect right so this is a case of reverse bank card as well as the reverse hill sac so what has happened basically there is a posterior shoulder dislocation and there was impaction of the anterior aspect of the humeral head with the posterior aspect of the glenoid now here also we can talk of the uh, engaging and non engaging if we see uh, the uh, amount of the bone loss in the uh, hill sac reverse hill sac it is much larger than that which is seen on the reverse bank cards so it becomes a engaging type of lesion So, so reverse hill sac reverse bank card with engaging and can you see the head moving posteriorly it's not centered or is it normal so no the this right hand image much. right image uh, yeah so this is if this all has been done in the same sequence now what happens the patient lies down in supine so even there is a small bit of this posterior dislocation that get neutralized by the position Okay, so you are doing in a neutral position, or you are doing a. Oh, we do it in a uh, abduction and external rotation. External rotation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's why it's not very significant. So when we went ahead for the arthroscopy, let me share my screen.
So uh, thank you, Amit. So I'll just share my screen. So we went ahead into the, uh, uh, we did a uh, arthroscopy for the same patient. So what we saw, that this is like a probe is coming from, anterior, uh, the sphere is coming from the anterior. This is the humeral head. And there's so a... Yes, the screen is not shared. Screen is not, not no, shared? Screen share. No. No, so we can, we're not able to see the screen. Now you can see the screen? Now it has started sharing. Okay. Yeah, yes, now we can see. Yeah. So the, uh, this is anterior part of the head. You can see what you can see is a subscap. This is a subscap tendon. We're coming from anterior. This is the head. Uh, you can see better with the 70 degree scope, but we do most of our surgeries with 30 degree. Uh, so this is where our uh, reverse hill sac. I'll just show the other uh, view which will show in a much better way small clip can you see one this one so this is the hill sac which is uh, anteriorly and this is subscap can you appreciate amit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So this is head, this is the defect and this is subscap as you rightly said what we see under the subscap is a reverse hill sac it was many times small amount of that is a normal shape from the uh, flattening of the head anteriorly. That is a normal, this thing. So we do the same thing. We pass in our anchor, double loaded anchor anteriorly into the head. And then we take anterior capsule part of subscap if required to fill this defect so that this defect doesn't engage posteriorly, uh, posteriorly in the glenoid. So this gives us uh, again, procedure is similar, but it is reversed. That means everything is anterior, while in the normal cases, it is posterior. So, I just pass in the anchor. After passing in the anchor, we take bites and fill up the defect. Uh, Ankit, any questions till now? Okay. So, what I have said, sir. Like clinical examination, uh, you can uh, definitely differentiate uh, whether this is a like a, a posterior dislocation, like it is a reverse uh, hill sacs, reverse bank cards, or a, a routine. Uh, bank routine card. usually, uh, Amit, in a busy OPD, many times, many times you just uh, patient because patient doesn't tell us it's the anterior posterior. Many times patient just says that jhatka sa lagta hai, and we just do the apprehension and we do do the screening. So posterior ones, because they are rare, they're not so frequent, they might be missed also. So that is there, you have to look for it. If a patient is saying that something happens, something pops, uh, then we should take it seriously and investigate further, rather than telling him that there's nothing. So that is a very important uh, thing from this case. Like we should not be missing on those subtle signs because here patient, because it is posterior and most of the time we are checking for anterior instability. Yeah, can you say something? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, likewise, sir, just to second what you were saying, especially in a busy OPD, where usually the complaints are of diffuse tenderness along the shoulder joint, a careful examination of whether there is an anterior joint line tenderness or the posterior joint line tenderness is very important. Especially uh, in patients who are not able to communicate their pain or complaints in their older age group or somewhere in the you know, 40s or 50s, where everything other concomitant pathology also super inside the uh, findings with which the patient present to us. So as posture instability is very rare, it's like 4%. 4 if I'm not wrong, it's like 4 percent incidence of the posterior instability. So careful examination is the diagnosis and subsequently treated. Okay. 
so okay fine we went ahead further things just like in a bank card we we saw that there see uh, the difference in posterior uh, bank card because there the capsular labral tissue is not much so there is no bulk you can see there there is a defect there is a separation of the posterior labral from the glenoid can you appreciate it this is our glenoid yeah. and this is what uh, separation so the amount of bulk of tissue is lesser than what anteriorly it is anteriorly we get lot of capsular labral tissue here the amount of tissue is less but we should repair it and try to take uh, bigger bites so that we can reduce the volume uh, posteriorly so that we can stabilize the joint posteriorly so you can see we just trying to one thing is there like we should denude the cartilage again from the edges and freshen the bone this i'm taking cartilage from the face not only because we'll put in an anchor because it is raw bone which is going to heal it is not whatever you do however uh, you uh, do the repair if it doesn't heal eventually it is going to fail so this is important biologically you should i uh, make the surfaces raw then only they will heal it should be bleeding surfaces you can say raw surfaces because only raw surfaces heal so we did this and this was how we do the repair so put an anchor posteriorly so we have taken a bite from posterior labral we just put in an anchor so this is the bite you can see that from the posterior capsule posterior this thing labral and the we make a posterior lateral portal to putting an anchor see because posterior portal is very parallel to the glenoid surface so we have to go laterally and this is how the bite is there it like we'll remove the cannula you can see this is this is how we are repairing the posterior labral just try not there once so this is after so this was separate like, like you can see this this is anchored completely to the glenoid providing the stability any questions amit no sir fine it is good to see like like the mr images like very nicely correlating with the arthroscopy images yeah that is a, the one of the purposes of this conference is that we are on the same page more and more we interact so more and more like there will be communication uh, gap will decrease like there will be more and better and better communication so right sir for today that i think this is uh i'm stop sharing my screen so three cases today we i'll just let me conclude three cases uh, we had discussed one was engaging hill sack with a bank card second was non engaging health sack with a bank card and uh, uh, reverse bank card with a reverse health sack there are there is more spectrum for instability this is something which we covered almost i can say 95 90 95% of the cases uh, there are few more things we'll be uh, discussing next time so uh, any questions ankit you want to have any concluding remarks amit you want to uh, have any co concluding remarks most welcome so as i just told, uh, like uh, for the imaging aspect uh, so once we have diagnosed like it is a hills axis is a bank cards we should definitely give the dimensions talk of engaging non engaging on track off track we should always try to uh, see if there is a history of instability still we are not getting any uh, finding we should try to search for small hill sacs small bank cards that should not be missed and the last case was important in the sense that reverse hill sacs can 
to mist even if it is a bigger reversal site collision. So okay. that we should. Yeah, thank you, man. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Anything from your side? Clinical examination is a key. Unless you suspect. Uh, one take home message definitely is that whenever there's any instability. Definitely, sir. Definitely. So uh, we'll say goodbye now till uh, next meeting. Thank you. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.